Keith Cooper is a retired infantry army colonel, Pentagon 9-11 survivor and Iraq veteran who's recently authored the book Taking the Mask Off, My Journey from Dr Seuss to the Bible. And Keith is on the line with us here. How are you today? Hey, I'm good. I'm grateful to be here. How are you? Um, excellent, thank you. So can you tell us a little bit about the personal journey, I suppose, that led you to write this book? Yeah, I think it goes back to, you know, why the title, why the timing, all, all that stuff. And mm. the timing was COVID. I mean, that's a simple answer. At yeah. the time, all of us were isolated, we're inside, we're told not to go outside. So really, all the phone ringing stopped, all the requirements stopped, and you had time to really think and synthesize what you're doing internally with yourself. And then you look at a lot of mental health issues that are ongoing. So the the atmosphere and the environment was set such that I could actually write a story. So what I did, part of my therapy was just kind of write a journal, right? A daily yeah. journal of what I was thinking about. You go back and forth, it may be nature, maybe religion, it may be relationships, you know, who knows. But it was in the morning a routine, coming down, meditating, a little bit of yoga, and then journaling about three to four pages. And and that added up to about 150 different entries. <laughs> wow. which you know goes along to how you write the book and i never intended to have a book it was really for my kids to yeah. say look you know here's what dad uh is made of you know we all talk about who we are but who we are is not what we do and i wanted to make sure they knew who i was and this journaling during this time frame which i went back to my childhood my upbringing my ups and downs all really comprised of who i was but it wasn't until sharing it with friends that they said, you know, you need to share this with a lot of people. And that's hence what drove the actual writing of the book. The title of the book, Taking the Mask Off, obviously COVID, Taking a Mask Off. Mm. But it was really talking about the mask we all wear, you know, the mask mm. of conformity, right? You know, you teenage, you got to conform with your friends or, you know, mm. at, at the office you conform, right? Mm. Uh, the mask of being happy when you're really not. So we all have these masks which are imprinted on our face. And I just figured, you know, doggone, it's time to take the doggone mask off all the mask not just the kn95s but yeah. all the mask and um the dr seuss to the bible was kind of a road network right yeah growing up i looked at cartoons i, I love cartoons you know and, <laughs> and i used to watch dr seuss and and charlie brown and all the rest of you know heckle and jekyll and all the rest of them but the dr seuss lessons of you know be who you are say what you feel because those who mind don't really matter in your life and those who matter in your life don't mind. So when you start yeah. with the origin being that upbringing and you go along and they have good parents from the greatest generation, the World War II generation who steered me right, and then you cap it off with a belief in religion and God, I figured that was a road I should follow. But the truth is, this story also talks about when I got off the road, right? And yeah. what I did to get back on the road. So I hope that explains it. Yeah. Well, mental health is a significant topic in today's society. So yeah. uh, how do you see mental health being addressed in the workplace, especially environment in environments um, th th that your background is in, like the military and our communities? Well, Toby, let me say that I think the military has made a 180 degree turn, and I mean for the better. Yeah. Um, I, I applaud the efforts by the Veterans Administration of the United States, the efforts in the military that I served in all branches right now. I will say there was a time when I came in where mental health was not viewed positively, and you were not encouraged to say if you wanted to go get help. And I think yeah. that's true in society. It's true in the corporate world. But in the corporate world and the military, I'll speak now, it's changed. It's no longer viewed as it was before. And I think leaders in the corporate world leaders in the military are making every effort to reach out even themselves going forward to get help as you needed but i think where we as society have a problem is we tend to view mental health and i'm going to kind of juxtapose the words has strictly mental when we ought to view it as health okay mm -hmm. mental health ought to be a subset of our health and not just well gee i'm okay but you know my head's crazy well that yeah. can't be the case right i yeah. mean the fact is either you're okay or you're not okay and when you're going for that yearly physical to look at your blood test and have a doctor you know hit your knee with a hammer mm -hmm. uh also to take a stop at the therapist on a way home and sit down for an hour and tell them what's going on and i think as 
as we do that, we get healthier because as our mental health improves, the health below our neck also improves. And that's what we have to get across to our readers. Don't make it a bad word. Yeah. Don't make it a bad term. Let's call it health. Absolutely. And how has your background um, as a retired infantry army colonel influ- and your kind of military experience overall influenced your perspective on mental health? Well, I, I think it opened my eyes coming back from Iraq to realize that 20% um, of our population, veterans, had some sort of mental health issue. Yeah. Uh, and then you look at our society. You know, veterans are now getting the help they need more and more. We're not perfect yet, but they're getting better help. But our mm-hmm. society, you look at the number of people who are suffering based on financial implications, based upon personal issues, based upon, you know, people can't even buy a house now. There's a lot of things ongoing. So I think the part that when you say what influenced it is, it's not about having mental health issues. It's about yeah. sometimes the environment we live in is so convoluted, mm. whether it be you're having a new baby, you're buying a house, you got a promotion, um, you got a car, or even the flip side of, you know, you're not having a child, you're not buying a car you want. All those normal things, when they're put into a bowl and stirred up, create an environment that someone who is seemingly normal probably ought to talk to someone else. Just like you have friends who are going through hardship, they need a buddy. And that's all I'm getting at. You know, be vulnerable, be open, put the judgment in the trash can and talk to people and hopefully talk to professionals who can help you and guide you along the way. No different than seeing that doctor once a year. Absolutely. Uh, And how do you think us as individuals can contribute to making a more supportive and open culture regarding mental health in both professional and personal spaces? Well, I think we need more providers. I mean, professionally, yeah. we're short. I, yeah. no, I mean, I, I'm sure you know people who are in this field. They, they, they're busier than anybody I've seen, and they're doing a wonderful job. Yeah. So we need more people in that in that field who can help one another. But I, I think personally, it, it all kind of revolves around the question you ask, right? Yeah. When you see someone and you go, hey, how's it going? Well, that's a common statement we say. But why don't we look at that person and go, hey, what can I do to make your day better? Hey, I know you're going through a lot. I want you to know I'm here. Instead of saying, call me if you need me, how about we just show up? We Mm. kind of put aside the people who we know are going through issues and give them time. And we as individuals don't need to give them time. We need to give them presence. And oh, by the way, be present with those you're with. That's what we can do. Instead of being on the phone, you know, talking to someone saying, I'll be with you, put the damn phone down and be present with the individual who may or may not need you. You may need that person worse than they need you. You don't know, but have a conversation like we used to, face-to-face, eyeball-to-eyeball, and no one knows your friend better than you do. You know when something's wrong. It's ironic to me how when someone does something bad with their life, how we have 15 people come forward and say, yeah, I knew he kind of or she kind of wanted to do that. Mm. Let's get focused now. Let's go forward now. Let's talk to the experts. Go to the experts in your neighborhood, whatever, and be able to get that assessment and treat your friends as friends, non-judgmental, and put your arm around them and thank them and and, tell them you love them. Yeah, absolutely. And this time of year, January and February are quite difficult times of the year for a lot of people. So how do you navigate these challenging months and how do you what advice do you have for others who might be struggling during this period well let's recognize what you said is absolutely right Mm. this is the worst time of year and i'm glad the book came out two weeks ago because it's perfect timing but i think the recognition that this time between now and valentine's day and even valentine's day is not the best time for (laughs) for people to be positive i'll say and historical figures show that it's not that i'm saying it i mean the data is out there so people need to be extra aware of their own circumstances and those they love. People need to be able to reach for help if they think they need help, and there are plenty of help uh, outlets out there. And I, I think that just the understanding that this, after the holiday period, you know, families have left, mm. don't forget the calls. Treat this like you would Thanksgiving in a sense of calling those you love your relatives. I was looking at the news the other day, and there's a new fad going on where grandkids are showing up at grandparents' house with sleeping bags just to camp out. You know, wow. if you got grandparents out there you haven't seen them in a while knock on the door bring a pizza sleep on the floor like you used to yeah. if you have parents out there give them a call you know if you got a brother-in-law out there who you haven't talked to in a while because you had a little spat put it aside pick up the phone say hey how you doing you know i think you'll feel better yourself yeah absolutely and i've mentioned about your military roles but you've kind of transitioned from the military to executive roles in corporations and are now running your own um, llc called one core consultants so 
what kind of challenges have you faced and uh, how do you think your military experience previously has influenced your approach to business? Well, I think the military experience and the business I went into has been very helpful because it was mm. more of a parallel transition going from aerospace to aerospace. That's the honest answer right there. Yeah. Um, I think I think the military's emphasis on integrity uh, has probably been the biggest factor that um, that I found has helped me in the business world. And truthfully, sometimes it paid, sometimes it uh, wasn't as successful as I would have thought. Mm. Um, I, I think the one thing that you have to understand is the military, whether regardless of what armed forces you're in, uh, they have strict standards, they have accountability, they have requirements, and they have authority. The corporate world is a little bit different, and I think that transition is important. I'd recommend uh, a good friend of mine wrote a book from CEO to CEO, uh, Bill Toady, phenomenal officer, and I actually had a chance to work with him in the corporate world, one of the best bosses I've had, and that's an example of someone who really did it right, came from the military, went to the corporate world, yeah. understood the word integrity and values and followed those through. Uh, but in a nutshell, I think it's helped all of us make the transition. I think the corporate world needs more good military leaders. Um, I think that what they bring to the mix, which may not be product knowledge, is something you can't buy. And that is the integrity and understanding of how to lead people. Yeah. And where would you say you prefer working, the military world or the corporate world? <laughs> <laughs> Can I do a neither on that? Um, <laughs> I, I think when I left the military after 26 years, it was time to go. Uh, by the way, I, I, I love the military. I mean, I, I honestly will tell you that my worst day in the military was probably better than my best day in the corporate world. I mean, yeah. I love the military. I love the people there. It was a phenomenal experience. And I have friends today you know, from West Point and the Army who who. I still have. I mean, just a group of us who are, who are very, very close. Uh, what I prefer to do is what I'm doing right now. Taking the knowledge I've gained in the military, taking the knowledge from the senior corporate world, and working with startup businesses in my company, One Core Consultant. I only only work with startups and real small businesses. I don't work with medium and large anymore. I'm focused on getting those people who want to make a difference in the aerospace industry, who have the innovative ideas out yeah. in the marketplace. And that's, that's where I want to be. And I also want to be continuing to write, which I do, and mostly volunteer. I volunteer a lot so those three things make up what i'm doing right now absolutely and as i mentioned earlier in the introduction you were in the pentagon during the september 11th attacks and um served in iraq so what lessons did you learn from those experiences that apply to your work today toby i'd say that the simple lesson is life is short mm. uh, i mean who would ever expect to be sitting in an office building with twenty five thousand people wearing, you know, a, a shirt and nice slacks and, you know, you're wearing a uniform and you're doing paperwork yeah. and that, you know, you were attacked. I mean, you, you just don't, you, you never had that before. Normally you have to go to a battlefield, there's a line in the sand and, you know, the good guys on one side and the bad guys on the other. Yeah. But when you're sitting in an office building in the middle of Washington, D.C., you don't expect that. You may, you know, think of a car bomb coming or a, a random shooting, but you don't expect the plane to crash. So, it opened my eyes and leaving the Pentagon uh, the following year then being a brigade commander on the Sinai Peninsula when the war started was another eye-opening experience and rolling right into Iraq. So I think all three of those really showed me the value, uh, care, the love that we need to have because we don't know if tomorrow's guaranteed. So well, let's make today a great day and let's look to help one another. Absolutely. And you recently took 34 days off to walk the 500-mile Camino uh, France is across a uh, part of France and all of Spain. So how did that experience impact on your your, your perspective on life um, and vulnerability and seeking help? Well, I think the truth is the book was written before I started the journey. It was just in mm. the hands of the publisher. So it, it wasn't anything that the, the, the journey had to do with the book, except the journey validated the book. The journey yeah. was key to me. Sometimes when you're walking along the path of life, you kind of get off a little bit, need to get grounded. So I actually took 40 days off and walked for 34. I took some time uh, looking around uh, Spain and, and uh, Portugal and France. But I, I, I think that it grounded me again to know that writing the book was the right thing to do. Uh, it gave me a perspective talking to people from other countries and what they were doing. It made me feel uh, one with everyone else on that that trail for, for many days. Many who had tons of money, some who didn't, but you know what? We were all the same. And we all realized at the end of that, that the journey was a reward. And I could hardly walk when I was was done yeah. but i also couldn't wait to go again so it's probably one of the best 
adventures I had in my life. I did it spontaneously. I decided in June to do it, jumped on a plane in September and uh, just took off from there. And I would do it again in a heartbeat. It was phenomenal. Absolutely. And writing a book itself can be quite a a tough process, maybe intense sometimes. So was it quite nice once you finished the book to have that time off and do something that is quite peaceful? It was. um, But writing the book was actually very peaceful and therapeutic itself. Mm. It wasn't a chore. I figured if I had to write a book that was a chore, I wrote the wrong book. You know, my background is engineering and mathematics and the military, and I didn't want to write a book on either one of those because that would have looked like work. So I figured the best way to do it is write a book that crosses all spectrums and something that I've experienced, but I'm not an expert at, right? Mm. I mean, I'm just not. And and that made it a little more fun. Um, But like I mentioned earlier, I've written over 200 stories so far. I've only published 65. So I'm excited to see how the book uh, is received and if there's any interest in any more stories uh, from the audience. Absolutely. Uh, And how would you kind of define and reflect on your own legacy, considering your diverse experiences in the military and corporate world and now as an author and consultant? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, You know, we, we hit a point in our life that um, we stopped the accumulation, you know, for the first 40 years of our adult life, maybe 30 years of our adult life, we're always accumulating, we're always buying, we're always adding, we're always getting a bigger house, we're getting a nicer car, et cetera, et cetera. Um, And and there's a point in time when you realize you have less time on the earth than what you've used, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. so you're you're at a point in life where you're looking at the end like, oh my goodness, normal (laughs) expectancy, you know, I'm kind of, I'm I'm beyond the 50 yard line, okay? (laughs) Put it that way. Uh, So you change from the accumulation and worrying about the vested stocks and retiring when you're 65 and having a lot of money, but you can't move because you're so out of shape. You change from that perspective to what difference can I make? Yeah. What difference can I make aside from giving money? Where can I volunteer? What can I do right now? And whether it's in your community, whether it's a national event, you change. And so when I take a look at writing the book, the jobs that I've done and everything else, I think I'm more along the line of what's going to be my epitaph on my gravestone versus what I've done. Yeah. And hopefully that that will be along the lines of, you know, he made a meaningful difference in others' lives, something that simple. And that's where I think it's gone from. That wasn't always that way. I mean, I wasn't always a person I am now. Yeah. And it's a journey, but that's what I'd like to have. Absolutely. And if there was one message um, that you hope people will take away from the book, what do you think that would be? I think it would be along the lines of... Um, Chase your passion. Mm -hmm. Be who you are. Uh, If you find that your ladder is leaning up against the wrong wall, change it right away. Um, And it's never too late, as Dr. King says, to do the right thing. You know, the time is always right. And and I think we have to look at that and let our young kids know out there, our our young adults know, even the kids of those adults, um, chase your dream, not your checkbook. And you'll live longer. You'll be happier. And, you know, continue to do the wonderful things you are. But um, don't let the mask conform who you are. Absolutely. Well, this book is, of course, called Taking the Mask Off, My Journey from Dr. Seuss to the Bible. But are you working on any more books or any other projects that are coming out after this? Well, I am. I uh, Funny to say that I have a novel coming out late this year. Um, I'm a big fanatic of the Cold War. If you look at a hobby, I, I love the you know the Tom Clancy type movies, things like that, and mm. the spy movies. So oh, I wrote yeah. a novel called The 16th Republic, which fictionalizes an attack on the state of Alaska. Um, and more to follow on that. Uh, I'll put it on the website. But um, it's it's almost done. It has to go to a developmental editor, then the editor, then publisher, same process, and then it'll be out. It'll be wholly different than the memoir I wrote on, on, uh, on taking the mask off. Yeah. And then there's another chance that could give and as I mentioned earlier, if taking the mask off is something people want, there are a lot of stories out there that I've written that I haven't published yet. Very similar, two to three pages in length with questions at the end if people find it helpful on different topics. Sounds exciting. And in the meantime, where are all the places that we're able to get this book, Taking the Mask Off? Amazon. (laughs) (laughs) Amazon. Everybody knows Amazon, right? Oh, yes. Uh, So it's on Amazon. Um, My website is www.longlakelore.com. That's www.longlakelore.com. A little blurb about me is on the website. Then there's a buy now box you can see and check on the the, uh, part there too. So there's a couple ways to get it. Uh, I don't think it's on Kindle yet because Amazon just released it uh, a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, so it's not an ebook, but there's paperback and hardback and probably ebook in another month or so. Brilliant. Well, many thanks for talking to us today. It's been great to have you on the show. Thank you.